Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this week's live Old Blue Talk. Um, we will be starting shortly. Um, if, any, if anyone has any questions, if you would like to type them into the Q&A box, what we'll do is Tim will give his talk and I will um, get to the questions at the end. Uh, so I won't waste any more of your time. I'd like to welcome uh, Tim Benjamin. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gina, for the introduction and for, for having me here today. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I assume that most, if not all of you, are old blues, uh, but perhaps there are some amongst you who, who are not. Uh, so for those of you who aren't, how do we explain to you what one is? So for those of you who are old blues, what, when you tell someone about Christ's Hospital for the first time, what do you say and how do you describe it? Sooner or later, probably sooner, you will come to the uniform. Uh, inevitably, it's a, a long blue coat and yellow knee-high socks. Uh, you might then possibly leap into a story of some kind. The story of Edward VI taking pity on the poor kids abroad on the streets of London, perhaps. Or maybe it's the socks. They are perhaps the most distinctive, certainly the most colourful uh, aspect of the uniform. We used to wear long yellow socks, you say, uh, or when they write about the school in the press, they say Christ Hospital is a school where the pupils wear dark blue coats and long yellow socks. It's a statement of fact, but it invites a question, curiosity. And so you embark on a quick story. I'll just take you back to my first day at Christ Hospital. It was my 12th birthday, in fact. Almost my very first experience at the school was being handed a set of yellow socks, neatly rolled up, and in my case, completely ill-fitting, itchy, and with a peculiar smell, and determined never to stay up on their own without the aid of elastic bands and so on. Now, my socks improved over time. By the end of my time at CH, my socks were incredibly comfortable, and they stayed put without any assistance. And you quickly get used to wearing these strange socks. After all, everyone else is wearing them too. But why did we wear yellow socks in the first place? How did that tradition start? The yellow socks, we're usually told, uh, were originally dyed with saffron to ward off rats. Rats, well that conjures up all sorts of images and the thought of street urchins on the filthy London streets of the mid 16th century dodging the rats nipping at their bare calves would be sure to move even the heart of a young King Edward the sixth. Now it's a much more effective story, that one about rats in my opinion, than the one about the pious sermon of the Bishop of London inspiring the boy king to take action. But hang on a minute, wouldn't saffron have been expensive? And the inside of the coat was also dyed yellow. And yet it says on the Christ Hospital website that blue and yellow may have been chosen because they were cheap. So in those days, saffron was in fact grown in England, uh, in Saffron Walden, for example, uh, but it was labour intensive to produce. And it was then, as now, a very expensive spice. And so any curious mind soon disappears down an internet rabbit hole looking for answers. And in particular, whether saffron has any effect on rats at all. So it turns out that there was high demand for saffron as a medicine during the Black Death, two centuries before King Edward took pity on the urchins. And the Black Death arrived in England due to fleas on rats, of course, as we all know. But saffron doesn't seem to have been especially effective as either a cure or a preventative. Saffron has actually been used much more recently on rats for medical research, and the derivative drug Saffronel turns out to be a passable antidepressant that works particularly well on rats and other animals. And so, assuming saffron was actually used on our socks back then, those 16th century rats nipping at the ankles of the early housey clad orphans would at least have obtained perhaps a more optimistic view of the world. And nowadays, Christ Hospital peoples are immensely proud of their long yellow socks, something which I think still mystifies the outside world to some extent. So here we have, in our yellow socks, a wonderful story to conjure up powerful images and to tell your audience exactly what kind of a place Christ Hospital is and how it came to be. So let me just introduce myself to you a little bit. 
those of you who I knew at Christ Hospital might remember me as a musician uh, and I had longer hair back then. Uh, I won a certain BBC competition and that got me started on a career as a composer. I also had a certain fondness for computers and by the time I'd finished university the first boom in web technology was just starting and an ability with computers was a useful thing to have. I started a tech company that did quite well and things went on from there. Uh, it's been an interesting journey so far but that is a story for another time. So what do I do now? Well I'm very much still a composer uh, but also as it says in the intro that Gina sent out I claim various other labels too filmmaker, writer, technologist and so on. But gathered together those labels, I think they're all about storytelling and that's a big part of my work. Most recently, for example, as a chief storyteller at a company called Infinity Works, which is part of Accenture. And there for several years, I helped hundreds of top-notch engineers explain to the world what on earth they were doing and more broadly being responsible for explaining in writing and talks and visually what the company itself does. And I'm pleased to say a bit of news for you just this lunchtime. Uh, this week I've agreed to join WPP, the world's biggest ad agency, as chief technology officer of a new division they've set up which is focused on high-tech storytelling. So a lot of what I do involves stories of one sort or another, creating them, telling them and helping people tell theirs. So let's delve into stories then. Stories and storytelling seems fundamental to us as humans, doesn't it? So let's ask first, why do we tell stories? Now I'm going to look at this from our very beginnings as human beings, from an evolutionary perspective and talk about some ways that stories have been told over time and the way storytelling itself has evolved. From our very beginnings as humans we formed communities, whether you might call that a pack or a tribe or a family, groups that were in some way stronger than the sum of their parts and a safer place for us to be. Our aggressive instincts as hunter-gatherers, they were very useful as we roamed the savannah, but they became less so as we settled down to a life of villages and farming. Once we did that, those among us who could barter, persuade and negotiate became successful. Over time, so much so that we as a species physically changed. Now that process has been called self-domestication, and it's interesting to note that in the period when humans settled down from a hunter-gatherer society into a, an, an agricultural lifestyle, it's called the pastoral revolution, our brains actually shrank by around 10%. Now that's the same as that of the dog, which was also domesticated from the wolf around the same time. So the dog's brain is 10% smaller than that of the wolf. So we exist on the narrow plane of reality that's essential for our survival. I'll explain what I mean by that. Let's compare it to other beings that inhabit um, our planet. For example, dogs. That plane of existence is a world of smell. For moles, it's an exquisite sense of touch. Did you know, for example, that the, a mole's nose has five times the number of nerve endings than we have in one hand? Incredibly uh, sensitive to touch. But for humans, that plane of reality is other minds. Storytelling arose very early in our existence as a distinct species during our self-domestication period as our brains changed along with our powerful ability to communicate and share ideas across time and space. In stories we create fictional people, fictional other minds allowing us to explore and teach and learn lessons of control in the safe space of the story. Our brains betray the evolutionary origin of storytelling. Our brains don't tell us the objective truth. They simply don't work in that way. Instead, our brains tell us stories. Our perception is based on change. If something changes in the environment, um, our curiosity, our brain focuses on it. Our brains actually most of the time just predict what should be there, filling in huge gaps in what you think you're seeing. So when something changes, something unexpected happens, our senses are grabbed. What's that? What's that? And that's an important aspect of how our brains work internally and how the brain, by a process of storytelling, enables us to perceive the outside world. 
But what of that outside world? How do we make sense of it beyond merely perceiving it? Now, our existence, if you think about it, is quite bleak. The world is out to kill us in hundreds of ways. In any case, we'll die within a matter of decades. Indeed, our entire planet will die when the sun absorbs it. Even the universe will experience an eventual heat death. Sorry to be so uncheerful. Nonetheless, we, uh, our brains at least, are kind of trapped inside this, this dark, silent ball of bone called a skull. So how do we make sense in here, in this dark, silent place, of that confusing, chaotic and ultimately deadly world outside? Stories are our mediation with that outside world. Stories that reach into other minds and give us a shared experience and make some sense of it all. Stories, in fact, from our very first moments as children, right up until our last moments of life. Now that itself, a moment about which we tell stories throughout our lives about what's coming next, if anything. And that's really what I mean about other minds being the plane of existence on which we operate. Without the ability to reach out to other minds and let them reach into ours, our existence becomes a kind of non-existence, like, for example, a dog that can't smell. So I return to this question, why do we tell stories? Now I look at stories as giving us the ability to do three things in particular. Firstly, to persuade, or if we prefer, to provoke, to instigate, or inspire. Secondly, to explain, to teach, to give understanding, to interpret. And thirdly, to remember, thinking of stories as a store of memory. Thinking back to our earliest days as humans, these three things, persuade, explain, remember, were of tremendous importance in making human societies successful. Think about the ability to persuade others, to cause them to do things and act collectively. The ability to share ideas, to explain how things work, whether that's you know a new piece of machinery, the best way to grow a certain crop, or why the sun rises every day. Explaining is also fundamental to a hugely significant part of our culture, that is religion, by seeking to explain and interpret the inexplicable and the unintelligible. And the ability, thirdly, then, to remember, to remember what our ancestors did, to enable us to not repeat their mistakes and to build on their achievements, to improve the lives of the generations that will follow, to leave the world in a better place. And you might well think that we've not been so good at that recently. Well, doesn't that go to show the importance of effective storytelling? Now, how did we tell stories then? These stories that were important to our ancestors. How did we tell stories in the past? The earliest stories formed an oral tradition, uh, which we call epic poetry. Now these epic poems or epic stories very much did these three things, to persuade, to explain, to remember. Now the epic poets, they were the great storytellers of our ancestors. They were capable of incredible feats of memory. For example, thinking of the, the Kyrgyz epic, which is called the Manas. Uh, it developed and grew over centuries and runs to about 500,000 lines, all of which are, to this day, recited from memory by the Manashji, who enter a kind of trance-like state to do this, using rhythm, tone and gesture to retell the story of the Kyrgyz people. There are many other examples of epic poems and stories, I'm sure will be familiar to you. The Mahabharata and the Tibetan epic of Gezar, both of those are even longer than the Manas. Uh, there's, of course, Homer's Odyssey in the Iliad, the Chanson de Roland, the Poem of the Seed, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Beowulf, the Norse Edda, and later, but based on earlier stories and poems of oral traditions, there's the Nibelungen Lied, the Divine Comedy, Paradise Lost, uh, and the Finnish Kalevala. Many more as well, I'm sure. Now, each of those epic poems is an oral history that transcends generations. They're often heroic, telling of adventures and a physical or mental journey. They consist of short episodes, often without very clear connections between those episodes. They tend to start in media res, meaning in the middle of things, usually with the hero at a low point and then after overcoming some obstacle or other, reaching a high point. Divine intervention, an underworld, enemies and flashbacks. They're very common features of the epic poems. Now, if some of those features sound familiar, that's not surprising. We have modern day epics that copy many of these tropes. Think of The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, for example. Both of those copy 
directly from the techniques of epic storytelling and the epic poems. The concept of the hero's journey is central to much of our modern storytelling, it's no coincidence. But these great epic poems, why were they so important? Important enough to justify the great cost to early societies of looking after their storytellers. For example, the Manashi of the Kyrgyz, uh, providing for them to do nothing other than remember and retell stories, hugely expensive to an early society. Comes back to these three things, to persuade, to explain, and to remember. To persuade people to behave in a certain way, to explain why the world is as it is, and to remember what the ancestors did. In a world without books and computers and the internet, these epic poets, the Monashi and their equivalents, they were the best way to achieve these three things. Some of these poems were written down, or let's say set down. The Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, can be seen to this very day carved on ancient slabs of stone. But it was important that the stories could be added to uh, by each successive generation. Their oral nature gives them flexibility. They were a store of knowledge, not just ancient knowledge. Now that's an important aspect, the recognition that human knowledge and learning increases over time, but has roots that go a very long way back indeed, roots that are important to understand. Now I think we forget, or worse, erase or cancel the past at our peril. Now later in history, much later in the 20th century, the word epic crops up again in the uh, epic theatre pioneered by Bertolt Brecht. So what's the job of the storyteller there? Well, there is some similarity between the performance or recitation of an epic poem and the performance of epic theatre with similar aims. So in epic theatre, which may be familiar to some of you, there is an emphasis on the audience perspective and the audience reaction. There's a purpose to make the audience see their world as it is. So epic theatre isn't kind of a, an escapist indulgence. The audience cannot be a bystander. So epic theatre developed what's often translated as uh, alienation effects to achieve this aim in relation to the audience. For example, breaking the fourth wall, speaking directly to the audience. Uh, they cannot sit passively and watch this fictional world kind of drift by if they're spoken to directly by the characters within it. They're forcibly drawn in. They would also show the inner workings of the theatre quite openly, such as backstage moves and the lighting rig. Um, demonstrating that it's part of the audience as well, not a separate fantasy world. There's also the technique of gestus that was developed. So the actor in that technique doesn't become a character, but subtle difference, they portray a character. In fact, quite often the actor will be portraying multiple characters, just as the sole performer or reciter of an epic poem would have to portray every character in that, in that epic. Each scene in epic theatre is usually a short play in itself. That's similar to the episodic fragmented structure of the epic poems, bite-sized pieces, each piece dealing with an idea. Now I've become uh, interested in the possibility of breaking the fourth wall in music. How often do musicians perform as if the audience simply wasn't there? It's particularly the case, I'm afraid to say, in classical music. Uh, particularly when there isn't a soloist, but sometimes even when there is a soloist, just behaving as if the audience isn't there at all. But funnily enough, it, it's seldom the case in pop music. Um, you know, think about pop videos. They're often performed with the singer looking directly into the camera, breaking the fourth wall. But what about breaking the fourth wall in a composition rather than in a performance? I've tried to do this in a couple of ways. One of my first attempts was in uh, my opera, which is called Silent Jack. It's about a highwayman, actually a highwaywoman, it turns out, in the 18th century. It begins with a piece of instrumental music to set the scene, an overture, if you will, um, and it's quite a suspense building piece of music. But the performer enters noisily towards the end of that piece of music, disrupting the suspense. Now I direct them to enter through the back of the theatre, through the same doors that the audience came through, uh, making as much crashing and banging as possible. So inevitably, People turn around and they tup and they wonder, who is this, who's this rude latecomer? Only to find out that it's a highwayman clad in heavy boots and cape and a hat, holding up a lantern and brandishing a blunderbuss, pointing it directly at members of the audience. But that's, you know, that's theatre. 
that's where it's you know where it's easier to break the fourth wall as Brecht uh, demonstrated many times what about in purely instrumental music so in uh, my my symphony which was played for the first time um, earlier this year I tried something a bit different so it begins with a solo violin playing an open A string so for those of you who aren't musicians the A, the a string of violin it's the it's the note that everyone tunes up to so the effect is it sounds like the player is just tuning up. Now it's conventional that the orchestra tunes up before playing. This is a kind of a, a signal to the audience that it's their last chance for a, for a little while to, to cough and rustle and finish their conversations. So immediately in my symphony, the audience are, you know, a bit of a discomfort. Is this normal tuning up or is this the start of the piece? So I'm trying through that technique to speak directly to them, to show them that this isn't a fantasy world I'm about to, to show them. It's a real world that they are part of. I think it works. You can have a listen for yourself, but you kind of can only do that once. So I'm going to have to think of something, something else for the next attempt. Anyway, back to stories. What's the role of a storyteller in society um, today? Who are the storytellers of today? You know, we might say entertainers so have we reduced the great tradition of storytelling to mere entertainment culinary entertainment as brecht might have called it uh, epic theater sought to distinguish from what brecht criticized as the merely culinary aspect as distinct from dramatic theater culinary meaning just kind of entertainment rather than entertainment as a means to persuade explain or remember at some point in our past, entertainment became an end to storytelling in itself. Forget the persuading, the explaining and remembering. It's all about the laughs, bread and circuses, perhaps. But those three aspects of storytelling are still fundamental to the well-being of our society. Persuade, indeed, even to provoke, to explain and to remember. Now, perhaps my favourite of these is persuade or provoke. As Bernard Shaw said, progress depends on the unreasonable person because the reasonable person agrees to everything and adapts to the world and nothing would ever change on that basis. Therefore, it takes the disagreeable, unreasonable, provocative person to bring about progress. Actually, I think storytelling is alive and well and hasn't been reduced, not entirely at least anyway, to culinary entertainment. Our society today has, has many stories that aren't entertainers, the storytellers rather, that aren't entertainers, at least not primarily. And they function in much the same way as the epic storytellers, the epic poets. Think of teachers, professors, parents, priests, even politicians. Although obviously we might think of politicians as storytellers of a different kind sometimes. We even look to sports people for a story, not just for physical achievement. Think of the stars of the Olympic Games. We can link the idea to, to Brecht's distinction of the culinary and dramatic. So there's culinary sport, which could be you know, a foot race between anonymous runners. And then there's dramatic sport in which each contestant has had a testing personal journey to reach the grand final. And through those dramatic stories, we are persuaded or inspired. We get an explanation for their physical achievements. And we remember the previous greats, the world records, the other names carved into the trophies. Perhaps we could also think of those who are able to rattle off the past 50 years of their football team's players. Perhaps those are the Manashi or epic poets of our age. Now, there are also among our modern day storytellers, of course, artists, creative people of all kinds who can be particularly effective storytellers, not just those that write words. Think of film, uh, of painting, photography and music. So how are musicians and specifically composers effective as storytellers? Now, my old uh, composition teacher, the late composer Steve Martland, he was a very effective storyteller, I think. And I met him thanks to a project he ran at Christ Hospital. Now, I wonder today how many provocative, angry young man composers like Steve Martland are invited to lead workshops at the school. I have, I have no idea how many, but it would be a shame, I think, if the answer was none. Steve was effective as a storyteller in common with, with many composers over the centuries by questioning authority, seeking to make progress, to make new music a living thing, not a museum piece. 
and to upset the status quo by being that unreasonable man of, of, of Bernard Shaw, by persuading or provoking an audience, also inspiring an audience to better things, by, uh, and by explaining. He was a prolific teacher, not only to his students like me, but in speaking to audiences too, but also remembering. Uh, for he, he frequently made reference to the past in his music and it was it was all the stronger for that. So persuade, uh, explain and remember. Let's consider these aspects in music a bit more broadly. So we can persuade, provoke, instigate, inspire others to action through the medium of music. We can explain something about ourselves through the language of music as in to uh, come to understand yourself. That often happens through a powerful experience of music as a teenager. And I'm sure we've all got a story of a particularly powerful piece of music and the impact it had on us. Some of you might remember that the Christ's Hospital Library used to have a collection of cassettes uh, that you could borrow. One day I happened to borrow um, a cassette by uh, a band, a punk band called Susie and the Banshees. Uh, ironically enough, that tape was called Once Upon a Time, and I still remember the first song I heard on that tape, which was a song called Hong Kong Garden. I was absolutely rooted to the spot, and I kind of tingled all over. I really felt that I had discovered something, not just new music, but also something kind of new about myself, a kind of awakening perhaps. So Susie, the singer in the band, like most of the punks, was of course seeking to persuade or, or perhaps to provoke. Let's not forget that. Punk music was also a form of explanation, an attempt to make sense of a nonsensical world. And it used a memory, uh, it tried to make us remember. You only got to think of the Sex Pistols, their most famous song, God Save the Queen. It's obviously a play on memory because it was done in a year in which the Queen's Silver Jubilee was being marked and the previous 25 years of her reign were being remembered across the country. To provoking or inspiring and explaining, music also has seems to have special powers of triggering memories much as smells do. Uh, we turn to music often for memories even ones that were not placed there memories that were not placed there by the composer but memories th that arose through the retelling of these musical stories and it's incredibly powerful just think about funerals what was her favorite song let's play that as she is laid to rest now as a composer you can help people remember and you can draw the listener's attention to certain aspects of a memory. We can make reference to earlier music and earlier memories and build upon it to create new stories. And I think this is why, at least for me, supposedly radical music that entirely rejects the past is often incomprehensible. A kind of a jumbled chaos of sounds rooted in an allegedly clever idea that you have to be told separately because you'd have no chance of gleaning it from the music itself. Truly radical art in music, I think, manages to transcend this problem. I'll give an example. Think of John Cage, his famous piece, uh, 4 minutes 33, consists of four and a half minutes of silence. So by rejecting music entirely for the duration of that piece, it draws attention to the entire weight of the music of the past and the future. By looking at the negative space of 4 minutes 33, we perceive more strongly the positive space. Right, so you might think that that's a bit of a stretch, but the genius of the piece is its simplicity. If you just mention it to anyone, anyone at all, four and a half minutes of complete silence, they will say, how can that be music? Music is dot, dot, dot. And you've immediately got them considering the positive space in relation to the negative space. Right, let's bring this right up to date and think about the role of storytelling in the modern world of, of work and business. In an interview for a job, the ability to tell your story, to tell your version of the hero's journey is absolutely vital. You need to let the person interviewing you picture you doing the job. You need to tap into their imagination. And as I've explained, reaching to other minds, that's a deep evolutionary thing. You need to persuade, you need to explain, and you need to recall your past great deeds, otherwise known as your CV. It's all about good storytelling. The techniques of epic theater perhaps can work too. Uh, they, the audience, that is your interviewer, they're going to be forced into judgment on you. So why let them be passive, break the fourth wall? 
So good interviewees will ask questions and engage the interviewer in a meaningful conversation, fire up their imagination. The emphasis in an interview should be the audience's perspective. That's the perspective of the interviewer, not the interviewee. But it's not a one way thing. A company wants to win over good candidates, come and work here, not over there. And so the interviewer must also be a great storyteller. They must persuade the candidate. They must explain what it is the company does. And they must also recount their great deeds. How did the company get started? How did it become successful? Why is it going to be successful in the future? These are all aspects that, if told well, will win over the candidate and inspire them to come and devote you know, a large part of their life to the company. Elsewhere in the modern world, think about marketing and advertising. Now, it's said in marketing that there are two kinds of marketing, content marketing and context marketing. I'll explain a bit about what those are. Content marketing means just giving a, a list of features, you know, benefits, packages, prices, specifications. But in context marketing, we mean the lived experience of owning that product or, or of using that service. Uh, reciting a long list of features is a bit boring. It's got 20 gears. It's got 4,000 pixels. We've got offices in 10 countries and 100,000 staff. Yeah, that's the equivalent of reciting a long list of dates over the past you know, thousand years and stating who was the king or queen that year. It's boring. It needs the context, the stories that go along with those kings and queens to make it interesting. It's much more useful, therefore, to show the context of the thing you're advertising, to explain what the experience of having that product will be. Here's an example. Red Bull contains taurine and sugar. That's a bit boring. Or how about Red Bull gives you wings. Now the first, taurine and sugar. It's a boring old list. The second, Red Bull gives you wings. It's a compelling short story. It persuades. Who wouldn't want to have wings? It explains this drink will give you those wings. And it's memorable. It's only five words. But it also taps into memories of seeing the Red Bull logo on fast cars and daredevil sportsmen and women persuade, explain, remember. And it's very effective. You know, they sell apparently about 8 billion cans of Red Bull every year. 8 billion. Extraordinary. I can't say I bought any, but nonetheless, 8 billion is a big number. So even better than explaining the context of the product in mere words. How about if you have a visual medium to show what the experience is? You might have heard of, of this mantra, show, don't tell. Maybe some of you remember the adverts for Cadbury's Flake from the 1980s. So for those of you who are younger than I am, uh, I'll remind you. It's basically, it's just a woman in a bath or another version of a woman in a field eating a chocolate bar, but she's shown enjoying it to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, everything works in these adverts to show us the utter indulgence and pleasure and luxury. It's persuade, explain, remember again, the ad works by persuading us that we too can have this experience or being provocative by showing us someone else doing what we could be doing. And of course, it's quite overtly sexual imagery, provocative in that sense. Also by explaining that if we eat this chocolate, we too will have a luxurious and indulgent experience. And for the clincher, remembering it taps into our memories of luxuriating in a warm bath, which triggers physical memories, or walking in a field of flowers in the summer, again, triggering memories of, of smell and the feeling of the warm sun and, and long grass. Show, don't tell. Context, not content. Indeed, persuade, explain, and remember. So I'm gonna finish uh, now with one final aspect to this uh, by considering tradition. I think tradition is in many ways a form of storytelling. I'm sure many of you will still remember the day that you left Christ Hospital, if indeed you're an old blue. I think there's a pretty good bit of storytelling right there. You might remember the tradition of, of course you'll remember, the tradition of the charge. The headmaster on our last day at Christ Hospital, he, he read it to us uh, and everyone else who made it to the leaving service, going back uh, as a tradition, presumably for decades or centuries, I've no idea. Here it goes, it, go, it goes like this. I charge you, now that's persuasive, or at least provocative, I charge you never to forget the great benefits that you have received in this place. That's remembering, of course. And in time to come, according to your means, to do all that you can to enable others to enjoy the same advantage. 
that's more persuasive and tying into a kind of epic narrative of past, present and future that goes on. And remember that you carry with you, wherever you go, the good name of Christ's hospital. There's explain, understand, teach. An implication that by bearing the good name, you'll be sharing it with others, either by directly retelling the story, perhaps the story of yellow socks, or indirectly by association, by listing it on your CV or your LinkedIn profile. Now, I think the tradition of the charge is a nice illustration of this concept of, uh, of persuade, explain, remember, uh, an appropriate piece of short piece of storytelling to finish with. So I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might possibly have. Gina, do we have any questions? Hello, thank you very much. That was great. Uh, and what we've learned there and what I should be telling my husband is that all those times I'm uh, being disagreeable, I'm actually just being progressive, which I always knew. <laughs> um, yes, please do type into the question box, people. We have staff, we have pupils and we have old blues um, within our viewers, none of which in my experience have ever been shy in asking questions. So do type them into the box. Um, I do have one at the moment um, from Graham, who uh, I think is probably at school with you, Graham Burnshaw, uh, who remembers you as a great musician. Uh, and he's asking what you've been doing recently in uh, Romania and Hungary. Oh, right. Well, hello, hello Graham. Um, yes, oh, you've, your date's there, 86 to 93. Yes, we must have, must have overlapped. Um, yeah, I, I was in Romania, in fact, rather than Hungary, for the premiere of uh, my symphony. So um, I mean, some of you might remember I actually did write um, a symphony while I was at Christ Hospital. It wasn't very good um, when I was, you know, 14 or something like that. But this was a new one, uh, which I'll call my first symphony, I suppose. Um, and it was done for the uh, Georgianescu Festival, which is a bit like an Eastern European proms. Uh, it's, it's huge. And, they, you know, all these orchestras from around the world come there. Um, so anyway, they asked me to, to write something. I wrote them a symphony and it was done there. Um, Rumon Gamba was conducting it. He's a pretty famous conductor um, and it went down very well. It was actually got a standing ovation at the first performance and it had, had two performances. So I was very, uh, very, very pleased with that, with the reaction and, and the way that the piece came out. Um, it's on my, there's a video of it on my website. If, if anyone has a, a burning desire to, to watch it and to listen to it. That's great. So uh, the next question from Trevor, what aspect of modern day life would you like to see encapsulated in a new story for future generations? Ah, well, uh, hello, Trevor. I do remember Trevor very well. Uh, he's a, a good, good chap. I think we last met at the 20 year reunion, possibly. Um, yeah, what, what story from the modern day to, to, to save for, for future generations? Uh, I think there's um, well, I mean, undoubtedly, that the, the thing which is going to have a huge impact on on future generations, or certainly the future life of the current very young generation, is is the story of the pandemic that we've just had. Uh, there could be cautionary tales that come out of that. There'll be tales of what it felt like, of what happened, what, what the cities were like when they're completely empty. Which you know, before that had been just a sort of science fiction fantasy. But you know, March, April last year, you'd, you'd go into the centre of Manchester or London completely deserted very spooky. So I think that's going to have that whole experience, collective experience we've had is going to have a profound experience on, on our storytelling um, and, and, and in trying to help people remember what happened, to explain what happened and to persuade them to perhaps do things so that it doesn't happen again or it, they can you know behave in a different way next time. So I think that that's probably something that's certain to have an aspect of our of future future stories. Okay, uh, and one from a member of staff here, Stephen Walsh, who, who remembers you and uh, your symphony, or he thinks possibly opera. Um, when your pieces are performed, do you break the normal hierarchical structure of orchestral seating? Oh, I do remember Mr. Walsh. Is he is he still a teacher at the school? Yes. <laughs> he is. Uh, he, he once called me a crypto fascist in uh, in my report. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there we go. He, he was an excellent English teacher, and I'm sure he absolutely still is. So, um, what? Uh, what? Uh, he's asking me about breaking the normal hierarchy structure of orchestral seating. Yes. Well, I, I have played around a bit with that. Um, the piece which uh, you might remember um, that I uh, wrote while whilst at Cross Hospital, which won this BBC competition, it did involve splitting up the orchestra into um, 
two big groups of instruments um, sitting either side with a kind of small group in the middle. Um, the, the trouble with doing that, I mean, I think it was quite effective because you could hear this music bouncing back and forth between the two sides. Um, the, the trouble with doing that, of course, for a, for a sort of 15 minute piece is that the entire stage has got to be rearranged. So there's a bit of an inconvenience for everyone. Um, but, but these days, what, what I do particularly like, which doesn't involve quite so much rearrangement, is having the first and second violins facing each other. Um, often, if you look at an orchestra these days, some, some orchestras do that, and that was very common in, in the past, but much more common now is to have the first and the second violins sitting next to each other. The downside of that is all of that music of the past uh, and, and perhaps the future, which was written with the first and second violins having a kind of a conversation with each other or maybe a combat with each other, it's all completely lost if you have them sitting next to each other. So that's something that I get a bit, a bit of a bee in my bonnet about these days um, in terms of orchestral seating. So I, I always like the first and second violins to be opposite each other. So you get that real sense of dialogue and conversation and discussion within within the orchestra. OK, um, and from Isabel, what advice would you give to someone who has an idea about a book, but no current experience in writing other than um, a love of, of reading, listening and watching stories? Oh, OK, well, um, I, I haven't I haven't written a book myself. However, I've kind of toyed with the idea, but I have written sort of large things, you know, operas and, and symphonies. Uh, I think the um, most uh, important thing you can do if you think about writing a story is to actually start writing and do a little bit every day. Uh, many people talk about writing a book, uh, they think about writing a book and they sort of fantasize about it and they tell everyone they're going to write a book but they never actually write one, and they never start writing one. So I think that's the first thing is is to actually start, to make a start, a very small start. You know, the, the blank page or the blank screen is, is the most terrifying thing. Put a few words on it a few ideas, uh, then it will start to become much less terrifying. But just do a little bit every day. You don't, don't want to spend all day every day doing it. Um, so that's that's the first piece of advice. Second piece of advice is write about what you know, uh, because what you know will have so much more resonance, it will seem so much more genuine, you won't be having to, to make things up. Uh, so it's a write about what you know, and that you can take that to um, to some extreme, you know, you can write about, you know, a fantasy world if you want, and it's just by metaphor, it's, it's, it's what you know, but writing about what you know, um, is, is very important as well. So yeah, make a start, write about what you know. Third thing is don't give up. Every creative project, and it's not just writing a book, every creative project sort of starts off bright eyed and bushy tailed. Yep, this is going to be great. I imagine it as a kind of a graph um, over time and enthusiasm. So you start up very high enthusiasm. Over time that gradually sinks into a kind of a, a nadir and you think this is the worst idea ever. It's absolute rubbish. There's no point in this. And that's when most people give up. But then some brave few kind of persist and they carry on and eventually what happens is you rise back up the other side and you, you end up even better than, than you were at the start. So it's it's getting through that valley of despair I think is, is very important and, and just writing a little bit every day uh, really helps with that process. Uh, and don't be in a hurry to, to, to finish this book but writing every day I think is, is, is really important. So I hope, hope that advice is useful to you Isabel. Look forward to seeing your name on a on a book in the future. Okay, uh, and from Maria, uh, she left as you were arriving in 1987. Uh, she uses storytelling for healing, for education and for connection, all vital in post-COVID times. Do you ever use story as a tool other than for business? And if so, how? Oh, story for, as, as a tool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, think I do all, all the time use um, stories as a, as a tool because I'm, I'm very much, you know, in my of artistic work in, in in the Brechtian mold I'm trying to um, I'm, I mean, you know, as I said trying to persuade people trying to to show people something about the world that they live in uh, which which I think is, is is true or at least worth drawing attention to um, so, so so yeah I mean uh, as, as, as a tool um, and I'm trying to think of a, a specific example I mean I do a lot through through music um, and through giving talks uh, and, and you know writing blog posts and the rest of it but um, yeah, I, th I think showing um, showing people the world that they live in, some drawing their attention to some aspects of it. That, that's the really important thing about about stories. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, ho I hope it I hope it does. The question's disappeared now, but um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, and we have one from Adrian with the surname Benjamin. I don't know if this is someone you know. No, um, I think it might be. 
<laughs> who asks, does it matter if a story is untrue? Does it matter if a story is untrue? I, I just actually remembered one aspect of the, the uh, was it Maria who, uh, who uses stories for, for healing. I just wanted to kind of just briefly um, uh, mention that again. I think I think it's uh, the power of remembering is, is uh, hugely important as part of the process of healing. And perhaps that's why um, stories work uh, for you. Um, and and uh, in fact, I mean, he, he's so Adrian has asked there, does it matter if a story is, is untrue? Um, I did mention in my in my talk this business of deliberately uh, not remembering the past, of erasing, of, of kind of cancelling, um, tearing, I mean kind of tearing down statues and all the rest of it, which is goes on at the moment. Um, you know, I, I think that's, uh, it, it, it becomes an untrue story if you erase things that you don't like about the past. Um, I think it's 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 incredibly important to, to still talk about those things and to say they happened and as part of a healing process of kind of divisions in society I think you can't just erase one aspect of the past so, so trying to answer both of those questions in, in one answer there I think um, that, that you know to say we do need to remember and we do need to recount what happened in the past so that we can learn from it in the future and to, to erase those past stories I think is, is a mistake. Okay, I've got no more open questions. Anyone? Anyone else? Any more questions? Nope, nothing's coming up. Uh, so in which case I'm going to say uh, thank you so much, Tim, for giving your time and doing this for us today. Uh, we keep an eye on what you're doing and uh, obviously we'll, we'll let other people know. So if you tell me as you, uh, as you do new stuff, we'll, we'll put the information out there. Um, for anyone else who's listening, we have two talks next week, one on Monday, one on Wednesday. You can find the detail on the website. Uh, I've got thanks coming in as well in the Q&A from uh, the people who are watching. So uh, okay, thank you for me <laughs> and, and from our participants today. And um, good luck with all your future, your future work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Cheers. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, everyone.